Welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems. Corruption, repression, manipulation, abuse and control are the damning qualities of far too many political leaders in the world. They steal from their own people, create mass repression, despair and often mass forced displacement. Transparency International has rated 120 countries as failing the test on corruption and Worryingly, they have also found that there is little or no progress in the last 10 years. Absolutely, Senator. Corruption is wreaking havoc in many countries around the world. Bad leaders have led to the highest number of refugees since the Second World War. People are fleeing their homes because they face violence, human rights abuses, and repression. To delve into this issue, we had a good conversation with Lloyd Axworthy, who has been recognized as one of Canada's best foreign affairs ministers. For me, this was a real treat. Mr. Axworthy was one of my heroes when I worked in the anti-landmine movement. Now let's get to the interview. Welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems. On today's episode, we are talking about some of the most wicked problems in the world, mass forced displacement, corruption, bad political leaders. And in order to help us gain a better understanding, we are joined by Lloyd Axworthy, actually the Honorable Lloyd Axworthy, who is the chair of the World Refugee and Migration Council. Council, Full disclosure, I'm a council member and one of Canada's leading voices on global migration and refugee protection. After a 27 year political career where he served as Canada's Minister of Foreign Affairs and Minister of Employment and Immigration, among other postings, Mr. Axworthy has continued to work extensively on human security, refugee protection and human rights in Canada and abroad. He was presented with the Pearson Peace Medal by the Governor General of Canada in May 2017. Thank you, Lloyd, for taking the time to talk to us today. Always nice to be in your company, Senator. Okay, so I'm curious about, let's start with your past. You were first elected to the Canadian Parliament in 1979. Uh, so, and you, you're still in public life. You're still serving the people of Canada. In fact, the people of the world. So what drove you to get into public, political life and public service? Uh, well, uh... That's a question that could take a very long time to answer, but I'll try to keep it short. First, just one small amendment. Uh, I actually got first elected in 1973 as a provincial MLA in Manitoba. Okay. So I served, served six years. Uh, and uh, at one point I was the only uh, elected liberal in the provincial legislature. And uh, I decided to run federally in 79 because I was getting tired of having a split caucus. So it was a... Uh, uh, a choice, but uh, so I've actually had about uh, close to uh, over 27 years in the elected office, which, uh, you know, was uh, an incredible career to have. I mean, there's nothing more sort of uh, for value and uh, exotic almost than think that uh, every two, three, four years, uh, several hundred thousand, or in my case of my federal riding Winnipeg, would be 90,000 people who would come out and cast a ballot for you. I mean, it was really talk about democracy, you know, at the coal face that that, that was it. And so how I got started, I, I think there's probably a lot of threads. Uh, one thing I, I want to mention, because I think it, uh, it, it, it bears uh, memory, and that is that uh, I'm still a, well, of a generation which grew up during the Second World War. I was born just a month or two after the war started. Uh, my father uh, joined up and immediately left, didn't come back for six years. Uh, I had several uncles and uh, so as a result, the talk about war and peace and uh, all, the, all the things that are incorporated, uh, people say in those first four or five years of your life is when you get impressions made. Well, I was part of a family we were living in Winnipeg uh, where uh, aunts and uncles were always talking about the war, peace, government. Uh, and, and as a result, I think I caused just a, my osmosis, you know, sitting as a little tyke uh, under the dining room table, listening to this conversation, <laughs> just uh, just kind of absorbed the idea that, you know, government was important. 
and, and I didn't not wasn't sure why, but I also understood just how the, the tragedy because you know, one of my uncles was shot down in the RCAF. Uh, some of them were wounded, and I said my father didn't come back from leaving in early '39 until until uh, uh, '45. So uh, my mother and uh, my aunts were independent; they worked on war work. So it was a very different atmosphere than what a, a lot of kids growing up. So I was a war child in a very specific way. I wasn't, but there's no question that affected my view. And I think the other thing that uh, another powerful impulse was. Uh, Post-war, uh, we lived in veterans housing in the north end of Winnipeg. And as you know, the north end is really the ultimate petri dish for uh, groups coming in, immigration, refugee groups, uh, ethnic groups. So I grew up in a very diverse, very inclusive. But I also saw the, uh, the problems of discrimination. I remember one of my friends, I guess we were about grade seven or so, came back and said, well, he had to change his name from Sawchuck to Saunders because he wasn't going to get a promotion at the T. Eaton Company if he didn't do it. Well, I you know, talk about a jarring uh, revelation when you're a young person. It's like, what's all that about? I mean, what? Uh, and at the same time, I also had a real uh, opportunity. Sometimes you're just really lucky. But uh, uh, my family uh, and I attended a small United Church in the North End, and the uh, the, the team ministers were uh, Roy and Lois Wilson. You would remember the name Lois Wilson. She still uh, was a senator for many years, was moderated in the church. But at that time, they were coming out of, uh, out of the uh, theology uh, faculty at the, what was then United College. And that was the, the hot hotbed of social gospel and the Protestant religions at that time. And so uh, they really were apostles, teachers, learners. And, and, you know, the basic gospel was you, you don't worry too much about the liturgy or heaven and hell. What you're supposed to do is uh, follow Jesus' teachings in your own life. Uh, and that means you have to learn a little bit what they are and then practice them. It was an incredible experience. And one thing that came out of that was I, I, I was nominated by, the, by the, our young people's group at that United Church to serve in the Texas and Older Boys Parliament. I mean, I'll call it Youth Parliament because... Uh, eventually, women enjoyed. But, you know, every year uh, for about five years, uh, there would be a four day session in the Manitoba legislature where all of us are sort of, uh, uh, kind of smart, smart kids are. We're out there standing on our feet, making speeches, developing legislation. And uh, I guess it just, again, was it didn't say, oh, God, now I'm going to run for office, but it certainly began to imbue it. Well, I guess one final point, uh, if I might, and that was uh, in high school in grade 12, just as I was graduating. Um, I, a history teacher, wonderful guy named J.J. Phillips, asked me to, asked all of us as a class to go down and listen to a, a, a politician at the old uh, sort of uh, convention center in Winnipeg. Well, none of us were too thrilled at the idea, but he <laughs> reminded us that 25% uh, of our marks were going to be based on writing something afterwards and so we paid attention and you know the first i listened to was mike pearson who is not your kind of hollywood uh, sort of stereotype of politicians He's a little little round had a little bit of a list or a bow tie but i listened to him and i came out of that believing what it was to be a canadian uh what it was to have a sense of public service he had just won the nobel prize and uh, i think that kind of set me on the path then. What a wonderful story. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall. So I'm going to stick with history, Lloyd, for a bit. Uh, you had, you've had you had many cabinet posts, but one of your first uh, was in 1980 when you served as the Minister of Employment and Immigration. Right. So, you know, Canada has had a Minister of Immigration forever since I can remember, mm -hmm. since I came to Canada. It's interesting that Canada has a minister and a department, whereas the US doesn't, you know, the UK doesn't, right. Germany doesn't. Mm -hmm. What does this say about Canada that we have a minister of immigration? Well, uh, let's take those two words, employment, immigration. It was clearly a judgment call made by previous government that uh, immigration was absolutely fundamental to our growth in employment and jobs and, and economic activity. And as a result, they set up a separate uh, department 
that was given the mandate to manage its immigration offshore. That's what, again, makes us very different, is that uh, we had a very large uh, immigration cohort of officials working around the world, and that's where the applications would be made, the vetting would be done, the interviews given. And I think as a result, there had to be a kind of a bureaucratic framework to make that work. And I think one of the major things that there was a really quite fundamental reform in our immigration law in it would be in 1977. Bud Cullen was the uh, minister in, 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 uh, in the government of, of that time, uh, Mr. Trudeau's government, and brought in a major bill in which incorporated uh, an item that didn't get much attention paid to it, about the whole private sponsorship issue, which, as you know, has simply become mm -hmm. a hallmark of our immigration policy. Uh, but I had a, a, this new Immigration Act, uh, and uh, I had a period where uh, the Vietnamese uh, migration took place after the war. And uh, to, uh, to the great credit, I think, of Mr. Clark's government, uh, they really uh, stood up and took strong initiative. Uh, and when I came into office, uh, one of the things I was facing is that we were being asked by other countries to do as we were part of a kind of a, another 15 nation steering group, uh, how many of the boat people we would take. And our Minister of Finance at the time was uh, not too uh, cherry about uh, gig expenditures. And so one of the reasons this is very pragmatic, almost transactional, decided, boy, if I can get public sponsorship up and running, uh, it saves me a lot of money. Uh, because a lot of individual canoes. But to me, it was one of the most exciting things because not only did it provide a, a venue for tens of thousands uh, of people to come, it also gave Canadians a sense of participating. One of the reasons I think that we still have a, a fairly open uh, view of immigration is that a lot of Canadians, through the sponsorship program, know that they're not rapists or druggies or criminals. They, they know that uh, people coming here uh, are based on the same reasons that our forefathers came. My my, my great grandparents came from uh, from Wales, uh, via Argentina, and ended up in Saskatchewan. I mean, so we all have our stories, but the direct participation of actually working with, uh, connecting with uh, people in the refugee uh, uh, sector, I think has made a big difference in Canadian attitudes. And so I think it, it was always that question because at the same time as doing immigration. We were trying to set up what we called sort of employment councils across Canada, which would involve private sector, government, universities, and schools. Uh, and we would integrate the immigration flows into that, which is why we negotiated a whole series of agreements with provinces about their ability to bring in uh, people that, that they could choose, uh, but that we would administer uh, the system for them. That's such a one. The, the story of private sponsors in Canada is really one of the more uplifting stories about Canada. And you should, you know, be very proud of the fact that you initiated uh, a program which is now taking the world on and is being replicated around the world. Um, so, but let's stick with history. Move moving on to your tenure as uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs, Paul. Well, I just wanted to, before I get to my question, I just wanted to say, Mr. Axworthy, uh, you know, I have a, a, you've been well known when you're a Minister of Foreign Affairs for the human security concept. Right. Uh, I have actually a master's in human security. I, you know, I <laughs> worked in the oh. anti-landmine movement. I said oh, this great. in our intro to this <laughs> podcast as well. You were one of my heroes, actually, uh, mm -hmm. when, when I was coming out of university and, and determining what I wanted to do. And, and a lot of it was because of your work, obviously, as Minister of Foreign Affairs. And, you know, I thought at the time that you were minister for a very long time, but actually it was only about four years that you were minister of foreign affairs. But in that time, you accomplished a lot. You did the Ottawa Treaty banning anti-personnel landmines. You were a part of the International Criminal Court and the and setting that up. You did, uh, you know, work on the protocol for child soldiers. So I'm wondering when you became minister, what was your sort of mindset, you know, going into this that you were able to accomplish so much? Well, I'll tell you, uh, Paul and Senator, one of the things that uh, 
is a great benefit. Uh, that was a time when uh, the Liberal Party, of which I was a member, actually undertook very sort of targeted policy discussions. You know, it wasn't sort of random as past resolutions. And, and we had set up a whole series of uh, meetings across Canada on uh, Canada's role in the United Nations, Canada's role in international development, Canada's role in, in dealing uh, with uh, conflict and peacekeeping. So uh, we had actually two things that happened. One, you know, I, I had a kind of an education and I'd, I'd taken my degrees, by the way, in international law and international government. Um, but being able to again draw upon the resources of the party, uh, and I don't mean just that uh, not simply to raise their hands or to be part of a referendum something, but actual discussions at Harrison Springs at the, in Quebec. Uh, so we came in with a fairly uh, good textured view of some of the things that we thought had to happen uh, and uh, uh, post the Mulroney era, even though to give credit, uh, Mulroney himself had a certain kind of uh, angle on human security. Certainly the work that he and Joe Clark did on South Africa was uh, memorable. Uh, so there's always been that kind of a, a tradition, but I thought what we wanted to do was to say, how do we pull together? Because you remember the, uh, when we came in, uh, the, the Berlin Wall had just crashed and uh, all the old conventional wisdoms were no longer workable. I mean, we were very much like the situation we're in today. We have to rethink a lot of the tracks we're on. And uh, one of the things that struck me, I can tell you where it came from, uh, you, you might know Michael Pearson, who was a grandson of, of Mike Pearson. Uh, he became one of my, my uh, assistants on policy. And one day we were just talking about saying, well, look, uh, the, the old sort of uh, hard format of national security doesn't fit much anymore because we've already been, been through all the issues of going on, the genocides going on in the Balkans and the Rwanda and things like that. We're saying, well, I mean, people are being murdered. Uh, and it took us back to the Holocaust where, uh, you know, the, the degree of deprivation was no, no expression. Uh, so we were kind of, we were primed, I guess that would be the right word, to start rethinking. And we looked at the UN uh, Declaration uh, on Human Security. Uh, which had been passed by, uh, I guess it was uh, not UNFLD. And one of the elements in it, we said, well, why don't we shift our policy focus to human security, which is protection of people. Now, we only had the resources that we could only focus on those who were being affected by conflict issues. I mean, but people today say, well, it's too restrictive. Well, we saw it. It was, it was much interested in disasters and epidemics and things of that kind. But we just didn't, as a department, didn't have the, the enough resources to go around. But we did focus on that human security issue. And out of that, uh, I think we were able to, um, you know, it, it began to fit the times. Again, sometimes politics are a matter of good fortune. And at the time, uh, you know, the landmine campaign was just emerging. And, uh, and my predecessor, Andre Oleth, had shown interest in it, the prime minister, and Mr. John Gretchen was interested, but when I came there, we were at a kind of a juncture point where uh, a civil society, uh, the uh, coalition, uh, were really at loggerheads with a lot of the countries because uh, particularly the big countries were really uh, sort of finagling the discussions to simply say, oh, well, we'll have a treaty banning landmine if, when, and how there's an actual war. I mean, it was just there's all the diplomatic uh, gymnastics they were doing. And we had a meeting in Ottawa, and, and that's which I convened, we convened as Canadians. Uh, and, let, and let me just digress for a moment, because I think uh, this is something that's often not said. I just had an incredible group of foreign service officers around me. You know, uh, Paul Heimbecker, Jill Sinclair. I mean, some of, the, some of the best minds. And they had been Michael Pearson on my own staff. Uh, they were really spark plugs uh, and they were creative and they bought into the idea that they weren't simply there to follow the old pathway, but they actually create some new ones. And all that came our commitment to, at the meetings in Ottawa when the, the loggerhead was there. The, the big guys were still sort of 
providing blockage. And uh, I remember going to the, the office in the Pearson building on a Friday night, and I had to give the closing remarks 10 o'clock the next morning. And we had a, a kind of a kibbutz session. There was maybe 12 people around the table. And uh, I forget who it was. I think it was maybe Paul and said, uh, look, uh, Minister, why don't you invite people to come back and we'll, to sign the treaty? And there was kind of guffaws and everything else. And I said, well, is that reasonable? And <laughs> they thought it was. And so we did some checking. I called the Secretary General and the Prime Minister, and we got a, we got pretty good responses back. So next morning, I got up and said, "Okay, folks, uh, we're inviting you to come back to Ottawa a year from now to sign the treaty." And people thought it was crazy. I mean, literally, the press commenter. I mean, probably it was always that way, and still is. Thought I was a little bit of a loose cannon, uh, and, and the, the scoffing was incredible. Oh my God, Canada doing this? What do you mean? 120 countries came. And we got the treaty signed. And I also was able, and I get give big credit to, to Jean Gretchen. Uh, again, we were in a very strict budgetary regime, but he found $100 million for me uh, over the protest of the finance minister to actually invest in bringing countries aboard, helping them to demine, helping them to reduce their stockpiles, you know, providing a monitor. So I had some, I had some walking money that I could use to set up that kind of framework, that network that we had. Now, one of the interesting things about that, and you've you've already sort of touched on it a little bit, was the Ottawa process not only was governments coming together in a diplomatic process, but it also, as you said, it brought in civil society and and, and right. probably for the very first time, really, in a in a in such a way. What did you learn through that process about using civil society and, and championing along with them? to convince countries to move forward? Because we've, we've seen this play out subsequently in years that, that have followed. Uh, uh, countries are engaging with civil society to tackle difficult problems. Right. Well, I, I mean, I, you're right. There's no question that uh, the general wisdom was that uh, civil society was there to be consulted. Uh, but there was always an undertone of ho-hum Sometimes confrontational, but sometimes okay. We've done we've done that consultation. Now let's go on to do what we want to do. But re remember, I, I came. I, I was a street politician. I mean, I got myself elected in Winnipeg, uh, one of the few liberals, in, uh, uh, by being on the street, knocking on doors, talking with civil society, working with them. So uh, going back to 1973 when I was elected provincially, uh, it, to me it was just a sort of second nature. That uh, the growing importance, and particularly in the inner city work I was doing at the time, uh, we worked with neighborhood groups and things of that kind. So it seemed to be logical. And the other point I want to, again, just to give some real credit, you know, uh, there was, uh, I developed a very strong friendship, which is alive till today, with Sandra Pat Leahy from Vermont, who was the great landmines uh, advocate in the US Senate. Uh, and, and, and he, uh, worked with the vets for Vietnam, uh, Bobby, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, and uh, they'll come. They were the ones who actually financed the International Coalition. So in a way, you know, we, we talk about the, the Americans through their civil society group, a group of veterans who had seen the kind of destruction that landmines can do to themselves and the civilians were really the Parkwood behind that, and Pat hooked me up with them, and we began to work on them. And then the the coalition. I have to say that this, some of the people in that coalition were um, very nervous and uh, sometimes not so uh, so collaborative uh, along the way. But it worked generally, and so it was the classic case: Mr. Outside and Mr. Inside. And civil society was terrific. Uh, and by the way, just uh, because we want to be contemporary. I've been noticing the comparison they've been making between the interview with Meghan Markle and, and Harry. And I'll go back to Princess Diana, who, as you know, took a lead on, on landmines and, mm -hmm. and became a, 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 a celebrity icon uh, promoting the issue. And, uh, you know, I, 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 part of history, I guess, uh, I had, the day I sent her the invitation, 
to come to the meetings where we're going to sign the treaty. And it was a day that she was killed in the accident in, in the Paris tunnel. So there's a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of interesting history that goes on with these things. And but again, it was an interesting combination. Uh, but the other part of it, we also had uh, not just civil society, but we had some major international players. Um, Cornelius Samarugo from the International Red Cross. Red Cross had always been, quote, neutral, but they saw landmines as a major public health disaster. And Cornelius came in, and that, as a result of that connection, we were able to get credible evidence that could contradict all the sort of types who were saying, oh, we can't give up this weapon system, it's in our security. Well, it was pointing out, it kills a lot more people in the, both civilians and in the military than it ever deters. And so having the Red Cross as one of the partners, and we also had some good country partners, the, the Dutch, the Norwegians, the Austrians, uh, uh, the uh, Chileans. You know, we, we, we put together a group of about 12 countries, and again, we work together as a network. And I, that's why I've always been a, a great believer in the power of networks. They don't have to be institutionalized, but they, they have the ability to integrate and connect. So I want to pull you into the present. Before I do so, I'll make an interesting remark. Mm -hmm. I came to Canada as an immigrant in 1981, likely under your watch when you were a minister. Yes. Uh, and interesting fact, my first application was rejected uh -huh. uh, by a bureaucracy that does what it does. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, you talk to people. I, I used to know the former uh, Canadian ambassador in Iran and James mm -hmm. George, a wonderful guy. Oh, yes, right. And, yeah. and he helped me. And I think mm -hmm. Mike Pearson ha had his name on my file in the end. So oh, right. all good mm -hmm. things come together. But yeah. let's go to the present. You know my history as a displaced person. I yeah. am very active in that field, as are you. Um, and you've created now the World Refugee and Migration Council. What, I mean, we have the UNHCR, so what was the driving force behind creating another global organization to do what we expect the UNHCR to do? Well, I, I think it was uh, created as a way of trying to support the UNHCR by, being, by bringing together a group of people from around the world, practitioners, policy people, academics, uh, civil society people, who were doer, who wanted action. Because the one thing many of us had learned uh, through our careers in, in diplomacy or foreign affairs is that the UN decision system goes to the lowest common denominator. And as a result, uh, a lot of things can't even be talked about. So when the, the big global compacts were being discussed in, uh, in uh, sort of, uh, what was that? Uh, 1917, uh, the two big compacts, the UN, uh, certain issues were simply not on the table. For example, 2017. 2017. I'm sorry. Yeah. Right. Okay. No, no, just... Finance, for example. You know, the, the whole immigration refugee system is financed through voluntary donations. So there isn't an, an, an allocated fee like you have for peacekeeping and other UN activities. Uh, and what, what was happening, because I had been to some of these pledging conferences, which was like going into uh, uh, something that you're raising money for the school prom. Uh, it was a very archaic and, and uh, very uh, sort of deceptive system because people make pledges and they're not paying them. So as a result, the system was underfunded. And furthermore, it, it, uh, the humanitarian money was going simply to keep kind of body and soul alive. And it wasn't, there wasn't a lot over left over for uh, the kind of what I would call livelihood opportunities where people could actually begin to find some way uh, living in a camp because as you know uh, uh, these camps are not temporary they're long-term decades old I mean the Palestinian camps go right back and into the 50s for goodness sake so um, but I think that that was the uh, really the sense that uh, there had to be uh, a corollary or a complementary group that would begin working on action related issues, try to be innovative, get out of the box a little bit. And that was the really the genesis of the of the council. 
the council has done some incredible work and you know I'm I'm very uh, proud of uh, the work and the report and the actions that are being taken and some really unique ideas. One of them, the repurposing of foreign oh. assets so that we not only use the Mignitsky and other sanctions to freeze assets, your proposal was to repurpose those frozen ass assets back to those who have suffered the most. And in many case, th cases, those are displaced people. I, you know, as your proxy, so to say, uh, mm -hmm. I stood up in the Senate and tabled and, and debated the bill. Uh, and in fact, uh, it, the proposal got adopted by this government and is included in the mandate letter of the Minister of Global Affairs. But there has been no movement and no action on it. Mm -hmm. Can you share with us what you think the holdup is? Is the government going to move forward on this issue? What can you tell us about that? Well, uh, for, first let me say, uh, at the Council, uh, your initiative to table the bill in the Senate was a big step forward and there was no no question of catalyst uh, that helped bring the government in developing its uh, uh, its commitment in the last campaign uh, to support the idea of a re, uh, redisposition of the asset but I, what i uh, what i see senator uh, is a real pushback uh, inside the officialdom uh, in our law I, I have to say this it's something i was in it was said 27 years and I had some great experiences as I did in foreign affairs. I had some tough ones, but I always recognized that there were you know, the old Max Weber uh, definition of bureaucrat versus politician. Well, it's true. And there's just a, I think particularly in the legal departments, I think in justice and some of the legal divisions in global affairs and other places, I think there's just uh, they just don't want to get themselves into a, a, a position where they're actually having to, to break some mold and do something different. I think they they have a comfort zone uh, and it's all sort of uh, uh, camouflaged with legalese, but the reality is uh, this is not a uh, uh, Ottawa, the, the, the canal way these days isn't a place for much innovation, especially on the international front. And as a result, I think we're stuck right now. And I think, uh, you know, the mandate letter is there. But, uh, well, you know better than us, the number of times we try to get commitments out of the minister. And uh, I think uh, my minister's now moved on to another post. Uh, I think there might be more chance with Mark Garneau because he's a very solid guy. I, I know Mark Garneau for a lot of years. And I have a great respect for him. He's a very solid, stable. But I think he's, he also... I think, as he once said to me, he was one of those people that saw the world from, you know, from space, <laughs> where you see the whole globe together, and uh, that that changes your outlook. Well, I think we definitely need political leadership on this file, and yes, I wish you and me very well, and I wish the refugees of the world very well with this uh, proposal. Right, and I, one I of the things that you, a, I'm sorry, Paul, go ahead. No, no, go ahead, Lloyd, please. Well, I, I was going to say one of the things that I, I've become increasingly interested in. Uh, because of the Biden administration, is that they're now beginning to show signs of real leadership. It, you know, he just announced last week a setting up of an internal commission to deal with migration and climate. Uh, we've been arguing, as you know, for that through our reports for the last two or three years. And we haven't been able to get the, our own government to kind of uh, connect those two. Um, we have uh, 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 Rosemary McCartney, who's on some very good webinars, but again, getting traction around the idea that these are two interrelated phenomena uh, is really a hard sell. And partly again, because you've got, you know, you've got a Department of Environment, you've got a Department of International Development, you've got a Department of Finance, and they're all in their silo. And the idea that you have to do something to actually bring it out. Uh, and there, but I think that to me is one of the really big tests that we're going to mm -hmm. have to face. What an opportunity. Uh, to not only show bona fides uh, as a country, but also to demonstrate to the Biden administration that we can be helpful. Uh, one, of, one of the things that you you you've talked a lot about, obviously, and and it and it does lead into you know what the senator uh, mentioned about the repurposing of frozen assets is, is that there's a lot of corruption in the world, right? There's a lot of bad actors. 
bad leaders that are stealing from their people to enrich themselves, often creating, creating mass uh, forced displacement. And one of the issues that you talked about recently is the creation of an international anti-corruption court. Uh, why is the time now for that type of court? Well, I, I think actually, you know, again, to, to give credit, I think uh, Judge Mark Wolf, who's a federal circuit judge out of Boston, has really been spearheading. He has an organization called Integrity Initiatives International. Uh, but why the timing right now is so crucial is that because of the COVID epidemic, uh, there's, there's going to be an incre increasing amount of flow of cash and money and resources uh, into trying to help poorer countries and what we know is that's just going to provide a windfall uh, for the kleptocrats uh, it just gives them another new source of uh, fertilizer uh, to you know to spread on their own garden and as a result uh, what's happening is that so many governments have been captured by groups so i i was the canadian envoy to ukraine during the elections and the control of the oligarchs there was uh, Absolute almost. You, you find so many countries in which corruption uh, affects government and therefore it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, prophecy along the way. And I think we're really uh, the key issue, uh, uh, the, uh, maybe just to launch from that, is that uh, my, my deep concern about what's happening now is, is the fact that displaced persons and refugees it's not they're going, just going to be in the back of the queue. They're not even going to be in the queue, yeah. which means they're not even going to be involved in making having decisions considered because everybody's focusing on their own populations and governments are elected by domestic politicians or domestic uh, electorates. And so if you're a displaced person, you have no, you're stateless. If you're a refugee, uh, who, do you, who do you belong to until you actually get um, so sort of uh, sanctuary and you, and you get uh, an application accepted. So we've got millions of people who are sitting out there uh, without any uh, opportunity to participate in decisions that are going to directly affect them. And that's one of, uh, and it's really hard to get to get that uh, changeover. Um, and that's one of the reasons I think the, the corruption issue is one I think that we could and should be able to uh, recruit a broader constituency to support these issues, because if you're an international development minister and you're, you're sort of shoveling out a lot of money for all good purposes, but if uh, 30 or 40 percent of it is being snookered, uh, mm -hmm. then that to me is that that's a real crime. Uh, and and that's why it feeds back into the, re, uh, the redistribution of frozen assets. That's one way to get them out. I mean, it's not just the money itself. It's also a way of providing a deterrence for people thinking that they can kind of uh, hide this money. And even though it may be sanctioned, uh, we know, for example, there are billions of dollars that the Maduro regime of Venezuela has sitting in banks of, in Miami. We also have some evidence of uh, investments in places like Vancouver. Uh, we know with the Gaddafi regime in Libya, I mean, we, and these are horrible sort of uh, problems for the banks and the uh, wherever the piggy banks are being held because all of a sudden someone's going to show up and say I'm a nephew uh, and I'm, I'm making claim on that money and uh, right now the law unless it's uh, redefined uh, makes it really problematic that they might get them. Now one of the biggest issues that Canada is facing now is is and it's uh, you know it's really dominated a lot of the the foreign policy sort of political discourse in Ottawa and actually around the country is is our relationship with China. You know we have we have two the two Michaels that are detained. You know what can be done with that relationship specifically to get the two Michaels out of that arbitrary detention. Well, what should have been done is that there should have been a negotiation. And I know that uh, the Prime Minister has said that uh, we don't negotiate. Well, we do. I was part of negotiations when I was a minister. The, America, the Trump administration uh, negotiated some 40 hostage uh, sort of releases, even though you know they were the great law and order defender. I think we put ourselves in a box. 
going to be very hard to get out of. I think we're handcuffed. So as a result, I mean, the report that came out this last week on, on genocide with the Uyghurs, uh, our voice uh, as a government uh, should be front and center. Those are the issues that, that I think Canadians not only support, but would, would want us to be a little bit of a sharp point of the spear. But because of, uh, of the uh, incarceration, and there was just, a, I think, a report today that they, the two Michaels are going to trial. Once that once it's into that system, it's uh, it's over. And I, I just think that it, it's a case of uh, painting yourself into the corner. Uh, how you get out of it, there's no easy answers. There's hope that the Biden administration may help, but they've got so much out of, on their plate. And they, they are going to come out. I just read this morning in the, in the Washington Post that uh, the Dem uh, some Democratic senators are actually looking at bringing in a resolution on China. And so if there is a place that we might work on that, but the, the whole idea of coalition building, and, and because the problem uh, is, well, Senator, you and Paul know, so many countries which are, uh, that should be part of a pushback to this kind of bullying uh, and this uh, hostage taking, uh, also have enormous economic uh, connections and prospects. And so there is just a, a, a talk about a, a, a divided uh, system. Uh, that's what you get when you're, you're one of the most powerful economic in the world. But you also have China's leadership, which is now the side that bullying is their way to greatness. And it's a, it's a, it's a tragic. And we're going to have to be much more uh, effective in stopping that, deterring it, working in the UN, working in other areas. But to do that, we have to resolve this other issue because until we do that, uh, we're just going to be, uh, we got handcuffs on. So, you know, I'm I'm thinking about this box that we are in. Uh, we've, mm -hmm. we've boxed ourselves into this corner. We, we want to get our two hostages out of China. We want to, I believe, as a nation, weigh in more specifically and pointedly on the cultural genocide that is happening right. of the Uyghur Muslims. Now, if you were Minister of Global Affairs today, what mm -hmm. are some of the things you would do? Uh, well, uh, I would have probably, I would uh, go and talk to Guard Party, uh, who was a long time head of our protocol, and say, Guard, well, how do we get out of this? He handled all kinds of issues. I mean, I think one of my, by the way, a little history, I think my second week into being a Foreign Affairs Minister, we had a hostage taking, I think it was one of the Latin American states, I won't name it, of, of business people, and we just got him out. Uh, it's not pleasant. I mean, it's, but uh, to me, the mandate letter I received, my first and foremost responsibility was to protect Canadians. And uh, I think I always interpret that to mean that uh, we had to do everything possible. And I just don't know how we got ourselves into this. I, I think we, at the time, I think Ottawa was very uh, occupied by the Trump uh, sort of shadow. Mm -hmm. And they thought this is a good way of responding, even though it was a, uh, and as a result, we got ourselves into a box. And, but the yeah. problem is when you're on a box, how do you get off it uh, with some face? And I think that's sometimes, you know, politicians just have to say, I'm sorry, I made a mistake. I think uh, and, and, and come up with a, a, a much broader China, uh, China strategy that would be corresponding to what we see going on in other democracies around the world. If we don't get together in this, uh, they're going to continue to slice and dice the rest of the world. Yeah, that's that's a, a very good assessment of, of the box we find ourselves in. You know, Canada is a middle power. We, we don't have right. enough economic clout in the world, right. especially not in China, to sway them on any on any uh, uh, on any particular issue. But I think I want to close this interview on a hopeful note. You, uh, you know, under your leadership, when you were Minister of Foreign Affairs, uh, the footprint was far larger than the size of the feet with yeah. the landmines treaty and the Ottawa, the Ottawa initiative. So I, I want to close this note and say that we can aspire to more. You are mm -hmm. a leader who has aspired to more and you've done it by building coalitions, by acting with like minded partners, by negotiating yeah. in quiet, in public and in private. And I certainly hope that some of those history books will be 
uh, dusted off and read again by our leaders in power uh, so that we can get out of this box we're in. Thank you so much, Lloyd, for that wonderful You're conversation. Well, thank You've you for left the us with yeah, lots mm -hmm. to think about. To our listeners, be sure to check out our other episodes, subscribe to the podcast, send us emails about who you'd like to hear from. We'll try our best so that we continue to move the needle on wicked problems as we have done today. Mm -hmm. Thank you again so much, Lloyd. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you. Paul. Okay. Bye-bye.